So, good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome all the journalists uh, present here in Moscow in the uh, Center Multimedia International Press Center of Rio Novosti and our guests in Brussels. Today, again, we will discuss the events in Syria, the situation over the past 18 months. All the world mass media are following the events in Syria. How about settlement of the conflict in Syria? What are the opinions in Moscow and Brussels? We will ask our guests about this. In Rio, Moscow, uh, in Rio Novosti Moscow studio, we have the president uh, of the Society for Friendship and Business Collaboration with Arabic countries, uh, ex-diplomat and oriental scientist Vyacheslav Matuzov. And in Brussels, uh, we have Roland Freudenstein, uh, deputy director of Center of European Studies. I'm very grateful for both of you to be able to participate in our discussion today. And I'd like to start with Roland. Uh, a few days ago, Barack Obama, the U.S. president, uh, stated that the U.S. does not exclude its participation in military action in Syria in case uh, chemical or other mass destruction weapon is used against the civilians. For the time being, uh, they are not yet considering such an action, but this is a very alarming signal. It means that the further development of situation in Syria can result in intervention of other countries. So I'd like to ask you, Mr. Freudenstein, what do you think about the most optimal ways of settlement of the uh, situation in Syria and what can the European Union do in this case? Thank you, Olga. Uh, I, I think that President Obama didn't threaten military intervention. He said that we're not planning military intervention right now. However, there, is a, uh, there are several scenarios uh, in the drawer. And uh, uh, if uh, Bashar al-Assad decided to use chemical weapons um, or other weapons of mass destruction against the civilian population, that would change the uh, that would change the picture. That's what he said. And this was then interpreted by the media as, uh, you know, uh, indicating that there may be a, a, a military option. So let's, let's stick to the language the president used. Um, and I think uh, things look less dramatic uh, on that front. However, uh, coming back to your question, to your last question, uh, I do think that things are, are extremely dramatic in Syria itself. I mean, 18 months of, uh, of civil war, uh, uh, estimated uh, 20,000 dead and uh, uh, more injured and traumatized. And, um, uh, and we have 120,000 people, uh, refugees in Turkey and uh, possibly around a million Syrians on the move within Syria fleeing from, um, from, from, from uh, the warfare. So uh, I'm afraid that we're past the time of diplomatic solutions. And I'd be very interested whether Mr. Matuzov has uh, uh, something uh, uh, to offer in terms of uh, what Russia could do to, um, uh, to persuade uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad to step aside, because I think we can all agree that that's the precondition to any progress of the situation there. Well... Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Freudenstein. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Vyacheslav Matuzov, our Russian guest uh, in the studio. And I would like to continue the question from Brussels as follows. Why do you think the tough stance Russia has vis-à-vis uh, -vis Syria is not quite understood by its Western allies and partners. You know, I would rephrase uh, your, uh, I would rephrase Roland's question a little bit. Russia is uh, tough. Uh, Russia is not in the is not speaking in the Security Council. Russia clashes with the opinion of so many countries in the UN Security Council and everybody says that Russia must do this, must do that. And always when I speak on Arabic uh, channels, uh, I always say that Russia does not owe anything to anybody while the 
parties in Syria waging this war, they have to do something. Because this is not Russia against Syria in the Middle East. This is the battle between the Syrian opposition and the legitimate Syrian government. Whatever you think of it, this is the way it is. And Russia has the right to have its own opinion and attitude to the situation in Syria, depending on how it sees the situation. And uh, Russia, as I see it, has a completely different opinion of the origin of the crisis in Syria on its evolution and Russia completely differently evaluates the forces that are currently clashing in Syria. That's why the attitude of Russia and the approach to this conflict is different in Russia. And let me remind to you what Kofi Annan in his uh, farewell speech said to the UN Security Council. He addressed the UN Security Council and the leadership of UN saying that he sees that the Syrian problem could be solved due to an agreement between Russia and the United States, which means that if Russia and the United States do not find a common solution, the Syrian internal political conflict cannot be solved. And it was not what the uh, Russian uh, foreign minister said, this is what Kofi Annan said, a person who is a champion of peaceful settlement of the conflict. So whatever you say about Russia's stance, whether it's tough or not, but Russia sticks to the principles, always the same principles, and I think this is characteristic of Russia. I'm not going to quote uh, what uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov always said. Russia has always sticked to the EU and articles, which means that Russia is against any intervention, not only military intervention, but political, informational, or whatever other intervention into the sovereign affairs of sovereign countries, while Washington today says that the president of Syria has to resign. He does not owe anything to anybody. Why? Does he owe this to the US, to Europe, or to the Syrian peoples? Yesterday, I had a discussion uh, in a video conference uh, with two fractions of Syrian forces. One of them represented the opposition, another one represented the Syrian Council in London. And even Syrians in London, they, even in BBC studio, had no common opinion. Half of Syrians living in Great Britain are in favor of the current Syrian government. Only part of them support the opposition and the National Council. So you cannot say that the Syrian people is united in its wish to overthrow the president. That's why Russia always suggests to Stop listening to unreliable sources of information, distorting the situation in Syria, and we need an objective source of information on the actual situation in Syria. The mission of Kofi Annan, the mission of the League of Arab Countries, the mission of observers of the UN were a reliable source. Who decided to put an end to it? They say it was the decision of the UN Security Council. I would like to see this decision, its number. I'm sure there is no such decision. But all the mass media are saying that the UN Security Council decided that we don't need any more observers mission in Syria. But why? Because it was the only source of objective information, which was not comfortable for those who want to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. I don't think that Russia supports Bashar al-Assad or the Syrian opposition, but Russia is against violation of international law. Since 1991, some people say that the world is unipolar and that now we don't need any more any international law, any UN uh, uh, articles or treaties. No, I think this is a mistake. Because if we follow this principle, 
we will finally see that like the fable says the wolf to eat a lamb justifies his decision to eat a lamb just saying that he's hungry that's no good principle this is no good this isn't what we should allow i sincerely support the current policy of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm very closely following the events uh, at the UN Security Council. I'm following the coverage of Syrian situation in Russian and foreign mass media. And I can tell you that now we have very knowledgeable people at the leadership of the Russian Foreign Ministry. The only phrase pronounced by Foreign Minister Lavrov, that it's not the Syrian problem that is currently being solved in Syria. It is the world order that is at stake in Syria, like he said. I think a lot of questions can be raised about Russia's behavior at European forums, at UN forums, at UN Security Council, but I think that it's good it's good when many countries participate in a process, but we need some solo singers, and I think that Russia is a good solo singer in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Vyacheslav. Uh, I understood that uh, the origin of the crisis is uh, the principles of the world order, which are differently perceived by Russia and the United States. Of course, we have two main players globally. I don't see any other major players. The other players, they are trying to fit into the pictures. Europe has no independent rule. Okay, that's a very good idea to ask uh, Roland about uh, the role of Europe. Uh, we heard the uh, Russian experts' opinion of the origin of crisis in Syria. What about you, Roland? What do you think is the root cause of the crisis? How does Europe see the uh, cause of the crisis? And what should be the role of Europe in the settlement of the crisis? And of course, any comments of what Mr. Matuzov just said are welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Olga. I I'll start with the origins of the crisis. Now, we all know that, uh, that, that the Middle East can be grouped um, into two categories of countries. Uh, one are states like Egypt, for example, that have uh, a, a, a long-standing identity and uh, um, more or less historically uh, uh, based uh, borders. Uh, and. Uh, no major ethnic conflict inside, and there's another category of states, like Syria, that are um, patchwork, if I may say so. Um, they are a, 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 a legacy of colonialism, uh, and uh, as such, um, there, there seems to be um, a problem already in the fact that you have a Sunni majority in the country, and then you have several religious minorities, um, uh, one of whom, the Alawite, uh, is the ruling class, or has been the ruling class of Syria for, uh, for decades now. And uh, it, it, that's, that's definitely a difficult point to start with already. But now what is added to this, and I think what is much more important, is that um, the regime of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad and his father Hafez al-Assad uh, before him uh, is even in Middle Eastern terms, particularly brutal, it has been particularly brutal against its own civilian population. Uh, let me call to mind the 1982 massacre of the city of Hama, uh, in which also from between 10 and 20,000 civilians died, 
in an attack by the Syrian Air Force against uh, what was labeled as an uprising. Now, at that time, there was no Google, there was no Facebook, uh, uh, there were no mobile phones, so indeed, and there was no UN observer mission either. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, it, it, that was possible for Hafez al-Assad because those were different times. Now, today, that just doesn't work anymore. And the third element I would like to call to mind here is the Arab Spring and is uh, the, the, the concrete uh, beginning of the protests in March 2011. We all remember this was in the wake of the democracy movements all over the Arab world. So, uh, you know, you have, you have three root causes, if I may say so. There were one, the, the, the difficult heritage of colonialism. Second, you have decades of brutal dictatorship supported by the Soviet Union and today by Russia. And third, you have the, the, the wave of, of democracy spreading through the Arab world and people demanding an end to authoritarian regimes and dictatorships. And let me remind you that it was in March 2011, peaceful demonstrators going out to the street, taking to the streets after Friday prayers, going out of the mosques and being attacked by the police and the security forces of the Assad regime. That was the origin. There were no bomb attacks, there was no terrorist action, there were no rebel-held territories in March 2011. Uh, it was peaceful demonstrators demanding their human and civic rights that were attacked by the regime. And then, yes, today you have a situation, today you have civil war, indeed. Um, and the situation is complicated and is, it's different in every Middle Eastern country. And we're not, it, it's not Egypt and it's not Libya. It is something sui generis. But I'm afraid now talking about Russia before talking about Europe, I'm afraid uh, that what Vyacheslav presented here as a kind of neutral and uh, uh, Syria friendly stance of the Russian government um, looks quite different, at least uh, from our perspective here. I mean, we see Russia continuing to, su to supply money, political support, and especially arms to the Bashar al-Assad regime that is killing its civilian population. Uh, that, is not the new, that is not the objective neutral stance that, uh, that I believe I heard from Vacheslav's uh, words. So, um, it, and then the last point, what is Europe's role here? See, uh, we, uh, Vyacheslav was, was, was so kind to talk about the unipolar world. Who is talking about a unipolar world today? Is there anyone talking, even in the United States, about a unipolar world? I don't hear this anymore. I mean, if someone says that the West wants a unipolar world, you're stuck in the past decade. Um, I think we've moved on from this, uh, you know, and, and when someone says that, okay, we're against any unilateral action because every, 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 uh, uh, every action has to be legitimized by the UN Security Council, and then the next sentence says, but we as a member of the UN Security Council veto, <laughs> veto even stronger sanctions or any sanctions against the Syrian regime, that's a tautology. That's called a tautology. It's like, I'm against it because I'm against it, right? And I'm afraid this is not a constructive attitude. So in that sense, there is no difference between Europe and the United States. There is indeed a strong coherence a stronger coherence than ever in the last 12 years or so on Middle Eastern affairs, uh, in this case of Syria, between Europe and the United States. And I think we're, we're working closely together uh, uh, with the US, but also with Turkey, uh, with the Gulf states, in trying to, um, trying to circumvent the blockage situation that Russia and China have introduced in the UN Security Council. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freudenstein. I just would like to ask you one little question. You said that Europe and the United States have the same attitude, more or less. Do you think that Europe is uh, ready, hypothetically, do you think Europe is ready for military intervention into Syrian conflict if it is necessary, in case? 
No, we don't talk about military intervention. Like I said, even the U.S. president doesn't talk about military intervention as a positive option. He says that if chemical weapons are used, then we will have to rethink our, our calculus. Uh, and and, um, and I, think, I think this is something that we can all agree to, but uh, 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 Catherine Ashton, uh, the, the UN foreign policy representative, or uh, a French, uh, French uh, uh, foreign minister, Fabius, for example, have clearly ruled out military action by the European countries uh, in recent days. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And now, Vyacheslav, the floor goes to you. We have discussed a lot of things, uh, the root causes as the Europe sees them. Uh, we had a comparison with situation in Libya, in Egypt, and Russia is again being blamed for not only political but also military support of Bashar al-Assad uh, regime. But Russia can also say the same thing of its Western allies, can't it? Oh, yes, definitely. When today we hear the ideas coming from Washington, because all the other uh, statements uh, are echoing what Washington says, as you see. So, Washington states that we need to support uh, arms to the opposition in Syria and this is happening in uh, this was at times when there were no military clashes yet in Syria the US said that we need to supply arms to the opposition and the US uh, in this respect uh, is uh, the vanguard of the international community in this respect. The U.S. say that they will organize arms supply via other countries, which means that the United States will sort of have nothing to do to this. Well, you know that arms are going to Syria via the Arab Gulf countries. The arms are being supplied uh, 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 through via the factions not related to Syrian National Council. Uh, arms come from Al Qaeda. P people come from Afghanistan, from Libya, Belhaj. One of the uh, leaders of Al-Qaeda who's been to the U.S. and Libyan prison, one of Libyan leaders of opposition, he and his people are now fighting in Syria. Based on official Syrian uh, information, oh no, sorry, that th this is the figure from French press, 6,000 Al-Qaeda people are now in Syria. So... Who is the Syrian government now fighting against? Is it fighting against the civilians, against the opposition, or against dozens of thousands of people who penetrate into Syria via Lebanon? The Lebanese government captured a boat which was stopped by weapons for Syria. Now, when the negotiations in Geneva are ongoing, when Russia suggests to stop military actions in Syria to both sides of the conflict, Russia is trying to put maximum pressure on the Syrian government to stop using military forces against its political opponents. At the same time, there is a massive supply of of Islamic extremists and arms to Syria. So the question is, what does the West want? What do Europeans want? Do they want to overthrow Bashar al-Assad at any cost? Or do they want political settlement at any cost? If they want political settlement at any cost, I'm sure that Europe and US and Russia 
would be in the same boat. But if they want to overthrow the current government at any cost, the price can be very high, can be 300,000 or more. And even not considering the Sunni and Alawi uh, conflict, if there was only Alawi group which protected its interests, its community, the conflict would be long over. But the conflict is a very fierce clash which results in casualties in civilian, uh, among civilians. Aleppo is the white city, it's a beautiful city which is now in ruins. Aleppo is Christian. The majority of population is Christian. Never opposition has had any problems in Aleppo and now it's in ruins. Why? These people with grenade launchers, with uh, rocket launchers, what are they doing in Aleppo? Now the Syrian army has to try to throw them out of Aleppo. These are the Turkish, the Libyans, Saudians, uh, Qatar, uh, but it's not the local population the government has to fight against in Aleppo. Roland, I don't want to discuss all the details of the situation in Syria. Everybody has his own opinion, of course, but to, to continue our discussion, my only idea is that we have to put an end to military action in Syria, to shootings, to casualties, because people are dying. Syrian soldiers are dying. The Syrian army, 300,000 people, it consists of Sunnis. These are not the pro-governmental guys. These are not allies. And when somebody kills soldiers and says that today they have killed so many soldiers. They have not killed the soldiers of the Syrian regime. They have killed somebody's children, children of Syrian mothers and fathers. Why? Why are those killing the Syrian soldiers so proud of killing them? These soldiers are not the children of Bashar al-Assad. That's the thing. So when Russia says that we need to stop discussing who's right, who's wrong, we need to seize the fire. Who's against the ceasefire? At the UN Security Council, when we try to unite all the countries to discuss this without the participation of Syrian hotheads, the United States decided not to do so. They didn't even use their veto right, but they actually decided not to discuss what has to be done to implement Geneva agreements. If the US have signed the Geneva agreement just formally to make a half a step ahead to put pressure, military pressure, that's no good. Because if they have signed the agreements in Geneva, the Geneva Agreement stipulated step by step the way out of the crisis. Now they say that these agreements in uh, Geneva, one month old, are already too old and no more good. Why? It's not about Russia's support of Bashar al-Assad. If tomorrow the political circles decide that the election has to be held. I guess Russia will be among the countries who will support jointly with Europe and United States the most uh, just uh, elections there. But I don't see such attitudes from the West. I only see their lust for blood. We should stop escalation of the conflict. We need to insist on ceasefire and then get down to negotiating table and discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matuzov. And now the floor goes back to Brussels. You have an opportunity to comment what you heard from your Russian colleague. And let me add to you another question. Why do you think 
that Syrian opposition, which I think should wish well for its country, at least we believe it, why don't they want to come to a negotiating table and negotiate with the governments of Syria? Because it's about the well-being of their country. They are ready for bloodshed for. Isn't it wiser not to shed blood but to think about the welfare of their own country? Yes, that would be a good idea indeed. Now, um, why doesn't it happen? Um, it, I, I th let's go back to the ceasefire that Vyacheslav just talked about. I mean, who's against a ceasefire? The, it, it, there was something called the Annan Plan, right? I, I, I dimly remember that there was a, a, a plan by the United Nations that was accepted by the uh, Assad government uh, you know, to step by step in a, in a finely timed process, end military action and uh, then get to a condition in which it is possible to negotiate. I, it, we weren't even close to putting this into action. I mean, the, the Syrian government didn't even come close to ending, seizing its military actions against the civilian population of Syria. Uh, you know, the, the, the Annan plan was uh, politically and de facto dead uh, after a few weeks. We, we all agreed on this. And actually, this is the main reason why Kofi Annan stepped down from his role. Uh, it, it, so, you know, who is, who is preventing uh, uh, it, it, a, a situation in which we can sit down and negotiate and the regime can sit down and negotiate with the opposition. Uh, I think it's the regime itself. But I mean, we can, look, we can throw this at each other for another five hours and I think our viewers and, and our questioners won't, uh, won't be any smarter after that. But let me, let me come back to this, the, the thing, Vyacheslav asked the question, does the West want the overthrow of the, of the government or does it want a political solution? Well, to sum it up, the West says that any political solution has to start with an end of this regime as we see it. And in fact, if you look back, you know, with all the differences between Egypt and Syria. But what happened in Egypt was precisely this. Um, Mubarak, who is no angel, who, who was a, a, a brutal authoritarian ruler as well, uh, was a so-called friend of the West. And what did the West do when they saw that the situation in Egypt had become untenable? They pressured the power apparatus in Cairo to drop Mubarak and his family and to initiate a process of democratization. Now this is what the West did, you know, whereas Russia is together with Iran and China, very good company, uh, is sticking to the government, it considers the legitimate government of the Syrian people, well, we could, we could discuss about this word legitimate for another five hours, but uh, this is exactly the difference between the West and Russia. And I'm, I, I'm afraid I, I, I don't see a way in between those two. I mean, we have to, some, at some point, we have to agree on one strategy. Um, and I believe that the strategy of dealing with the situation in Egypt was better and more efficient than the strategy that Russia and China are following in the Syrian case. Uh, last point about sovereignty, national sovereignty. You know, we hear a lot of talk about like uh, 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 national sovereignty is sacrosanct uh, and there cannot be any foreign intervention, be it politically or, uh, or, or in, in a humanitarian way or even militarily uh, uh, by foreign forces. Yes. Uh, but there is something called crimes against humanity. And the UN High Commissioner uh, on Human Rights has, uh, has actually stated that the situation in Syria, and that includes first and foremost the actions of the regime, is now verging on crimes against humanity. And that changes the picture about sovereignty. And this is in fact why the European Union has enacted a, a, a catalog of 17 different kinds of sanctions against the, uh, uh, the Assad regime. This has nothing to do with the disrespect of international law. This has nothing to do with a unipolar world order. 
This is uh, pure and simple following the, the modern interpretation of international law, which is that crimes against humanity change the picture and relativize the notion of national sovereignty. Uh, Vyacheslav Nikolaevich, Vyacheslav, uh, I'd like to ask you to give a brief comment, after which I would like to involve journalists in our Moscow studio to start with. Uh, Roland, Human Rights Watch last report to the UN Security Council shows that it's not only the governmental forces in Syria that violate the human rights, but also the opposition which started military uh, uh, military action also violates human rights. If you look at what happened in Hula village, this is very much like bloodshed when, you know, children, uh, women, uh, elder people are killed. This is very much like the action of Syrian Muslim brothers, which after the events in Hama in 1982, uh, you remember that Muslim brothers, uh, they practiced uh, the same, uh, the same action against uh, the Soviet military experts. We had 6,000 military experts in Syria at those times, headed by uh, Colonel Yashkin. Every week, Muslim brothers cut the throats of two or three Soviet colonels in uh, the uh, Damask Central uh, Marketplace. And when uh, the investigation was made, then uh, the uh, traces came to Jordan. And the King of Jordan, Hossein, said that Muslim brothers acting like this in Syrian territory, which resulted in events in Hama, by the way, Th these Muslim brothers were supported by the CIA with the headquarters in Munich at that time because uh, the CIA Middle Eastern headquarters are situated in Munich, were situated in Munich at that time. Thank you, Vyacheslav. And now let me suggest uh, to the journalists in Moscow to ask their questions because you are right, we can continue discussing this for hours. Do we have any questions in Moscow? Yes, please uh, ask your question, uh, introduce yourself, and say to whom the question is addressed. Uh, Press TV, uh, Iranian uh, TV, uh, and knowledge. Uh, which language should I speak? English, Russian? Okay, let me ask it in English. For you, um, yesterday we um, heard from the Syrian government delegation who were in Moscow for a few days to talk uh, with the foreign minister Sergei Lavrov, and they actually said uh, repeatedly that um, the Syrian government is um, willing to hold a national dialogue. It wants to hold a national dialogue uh, to start a to stop the violence and uh, start a political um, process in the country. Mm, well, what do you see as a, a well, what, do you, what does Europe see as, a, as the most viable solution to the Syrian crisis in the light of the Syrian government saying that they are willing to listen to everybody and hold this national, national dialogue? The question was to you. That's indeed a, a key question. What, uh, what are the, the preconditions for political dialogue? Uh, you know, everyone loves political dialogue, uh, maybe except for the Al-Qaeda guys. Uh, I'm going to come to that later on. But, um, uh, you know, the, the attitude of the European Union and the United States is, and most of the countries in the world, is that a precondition to a political dialogue is a clear signal by the regime that, they, that the, the Assad family will step down. You know, the, the time has passed when a, a, a kind of deal could be negotiated between the Assad regime and the opposition. This is over. The, it, you know, it's unrealistic to expect the, any part of the opposition. Um, and that includes the seculars, and that includes the Free Syrian Army, then that includes the whole Syrian National Council. It is unrealistic to expect these people to sit down at a table uh, with the Assad 
family itself uh, with the, the, the close circle of, of uh, power holders uh, uh, in, in Damascus. Uh, and it's especially unrealistic uh, for them to expect, uh, for, for, for anyone to expect them to sit down at a table while the bloodshed is continuing. And I, 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 I certainly sincerely believe that uh, it, it, this, is, this has to be the point of departure. The, the, uh, the, the, a clear signal that the Assad days are over. Thank you. Do you have any other question or? Uh, what, what do you, it's, it's a known fact that uh, people from um, uh, the Western media, uh, the reporters from the Western media, have been saying that Al Qaeda is now operating in Syria. What do you say about that? Yeah, that's a very good point. I was, I was actually going to come to that uh, because uh, uh, Vyacheslav Nikolaevich also mentioned, mentioned Al Qaeda a couple of times. You see, in your question, the decisive word is the word now. Yes, now Al Qaeda is in Syria. By the way, even if it's 6,000 people, which I, I mean, I, 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 wonder whether, I wonder where the number of 6,000 comes from. Uh, but uh, anyway, it, 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 this is a situation which has developed over 18 months. And uh, uh, the, the problem of jihadist and Salafist uh, forces in the Syrian opposition uh, would not be half as bad if the international community, and that means Russia and China, had agreed earlier to a constructive way to end the conflict in Syria. You know? And this is actually why I believe that uh, it, 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 you know, any option involving leaving the Assad regime somehow in power or in con still in control of the country is unrealistic is because the situation has evolved by now. The situation has developed uh, because uh, there was not enough outside pressure on the regime. And, uh, and, and, this, and if this continues, this, yeah, indeed, then the risk will increase that we get some kind of either uh, an Islamist regime in Syria, but more likely uh, actually a, a collapse of the Syrian state and a, uh, a, 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 some kind of partition into, into different uh, ethnically characterized or sectarian uh, regions of the country with a protracted uh, military conflict between those parts of the country. Uh, but, 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 you know, as I said, I think if, if the international community had acted earlier on uh, in the conflict in trying to, to, to realistically assess the situation and say that, look, the, 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 there, there is no more constructive solution possible with the Assad regime, then we would not be in this situation that we're in now. Thank you, Thank you, Vyacheslav. Who counted these 6,000 Al-Qaeda guys there? Where does the figure come from? It's from the French press. I just read this today in internet uh, that this comes uh, from a French newspaper uh, that based on French journalists assessment there are 6,000 Al-Qaeda guys only Al-Qaeda there are other factions from Libya and other countries so these are only Al-Qaeda guys uh, and uh, let me add something to what Roland said Roland mentioned a few times that the precondition should be the resignment of Bashar al-Assad. You know, Russia does not think that Bashar al-Assad should stay in power at any cost. No. He's not a holy cow Russia is fighting for. No. Not at all. Roland, let's not let Hillary Clinton and Sergei Lavrov to decide who will be the head of Syrian country. Not you, not me. We are not the ones to decide who should be the head of the Syrian government. Let the Syrian people decide who they want their president to be. Let the Syrians say that they don't want Bashar al-Assad anymore. Let the national council decide this if we try to decide this instead of the government uh, instead of the people of Syria this would be wrong and this is the 
conflict of uh, attitudes between Russia and US. Russia thinks that the Syrians should decide who they want to be their president. The United States think that they have decided that they don't want Bashar al-Assad to be anymore the president of Syria. This is wrong as we think it. Thank you, thank you. And once again, I would like to go back to Brussels. Maybe there are some questions from journalists in Brussels. If you have any questions, please introduce yourselves and say to whom your question is addressed. Hi, my name is Lawrence Norman. I'm a reporter with the uh, Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones. I have a couple of questions.